Hello everyone. Namaste, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Well, it's late afternoon here in Nepal. It's GMT plus, plus 545. I hope you are doing all great. Uh, this is Suraj Gautam, a civil engineer and a disaster risk reduction and management professional from Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction. And I'll be your host for today's session. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all to our fourth webinar on disaster risk reduction and management. The theme for today's webinar is use of uh, frontier technologies in disaster risk reduction and management, where we would be talking about the ground experiences and number of initiatives that has been ongoing. On behalf of the organizing team, we are really grateful to our speakers who will be sharing us with their insights and healthy experiences. So we would like to welcome our speakers. Uh, our first speaker is engineer Uttam Pudasaini, who is a GIS analyst and UAB specialist and is also working as a co-founder at NAXA, uh, Nepal Flying Labs and Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction. Similarly, we'll be having second presentation from Associate Professor Rizan Bhakta Kayasta sir from Department of Environmental and Science Engineering, uh, School of Sciences, Kathmandu University, Dhulikhel. Similarly, we'll be having third presentation from engineer Darpan Pudasaini, who is a co-founder at Draw Nepal. Uh, our fourth presentation will be from Nirmal Adhikari, who, will, who is working as a new frontier technology coding hub manager at Build Change Nepal. Uh, similarly, we'll be having our fifth presentation. Uh, the fifth presentation will be, by, uh, will be from engineer Pukar Parazuli, who is uh, working as a UAV and GNSS enthusiast. So, it is indeed an honor to have insights from our distinguished speakers. And also we would like to welcome all of our participants who are attending this session. We are very pleased to share that our graphs of webinar registration has been increasing at a very healthy rate. Our webinar event is also featured in the Relief Web and Prevention Web website. Uh, the topic being very relevant and interesting, we, have, uh, we had a registrations of around 85 in the very first day of the release of our poster. And till date, we have uh, 189 registrations from different corners of the globe. So to address this request, uh, we'll be going live on our social media page of Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction. Uh, we'll be, uh, similarly, uh, we'll be taking all those queries and feedback from our Zoom chat box, as well as from our uh, social media live stream. The webinar on, Hima uh, on disaster risk reduction is organized by Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction on a regular basis. Uh, we believe this webinar series on disaster risk reduction has been supporting our early career scientists, DRR professionals, professors, and all the participants. And yes, it is a beginning and uh, we'll be, we'll be, uh, we have a long way ahead. Uh, so let me share some brief introduction about the in Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction. Uh, well, Inst Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction has been working as a, a research organization and uh, uh, I'd like to share a slide for this. Our team constitutes of professionals with expertise and experiences in the field of disaster risk reduction in understanding the risks, uh, conducting academic research and field level implementations in Nepal and across the globe. And uh, we have been carrying out a number of uh, interesting projects, which I'll be sharing here. Uh, so we have a mission. We have a mission to prioritize, train, and mobilize uh, the DRRM professionals and promote DRRM solutions through science, engineering, technology, and innovation. And uh, we have a vision of preparing risks informed societies for disaster resilience and sustainable development. Uh, our thematic areas are under the four uh, sectors, as you can also see. Uh, one is the DRRM consulting, other is the research and development. The other is uh, we have a concept of disaster academy and the other is youth in DRRM. So some of our initiatives uh, that I would like to share with you. Uh, we, during this COVID-19 response, our team had a collaborative approach where we collaborated with the number of organizations and uh, uh, helped in developing a national platform for uh, the information di dissemination uh, that is being endorsed by Ministry of Health and Population. Uh, besides, we, we also had a, a UAB surveying uh, at the Hetora sub-metropolitan city. I would like to share a, a short, very short video on this. Uh, 
uh, regarding the use of frontier technology. So yes, uh, especially uh, the the topic is also very relevant to the, what I'm presenting here. Uh, the use of frontier technologies has been a, a new paradigm shift in understanding the RICs. And so far we have been uh, carrying out the drone surveying of Hetoda sub-metropolitan city. Uh, so far we have uh, completed the survey of around 120 square kilometer. And a part of uh, the area has been processed and uh, we are uh, digitizing it and such kind of layers have been prepared till date. So we are also uh, collaborating with the number of organizations on this uh, work where uh, Nepal Flying Labs, Noxa Private Limited, Drone Nepal, ING uh, groups, and uh, Nepal Engineers Association Bagmati Pradesh has been uh, collaboratively working with us. So in this way, we have been working out and uh, we have also published our voluntary commitment in the Sendai voluntary commitment, as you can also uh, catch it out in the uh, Prevention Web website. So we have also been organizing uh, uh, this Himalayan webinar series on a regular basis. And today we are uh, going through this uh, very interesting session on frontier technology for uh, disaster risk reduction and management. So now I would like to share some house rules for this webinar. Uh, the audio and video of the participants will be switched off. Uh, for any queries, the participants uh, can write up in the chat box or in the comment section of the Facebook streaming live. The waiting rooms has been enabled. Only the registered participants uh, will be allowed to join our session. And also I would like to request our participants to please rename their uh, name as it has been mentioned in the registered address. Uh, similarly, the feedback links will be provided during the session and we will be providing certificates, a participation certificate uh, of this session. So without any delay, I would like to move on with our session and may I request Dr. Basantaraj Adhikari uh, to proceed with his moderation. Thank you for now. Uh, thank you, Suresh. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Uh, thank you, Executive Director, Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction. Um, Today, as Suraj already mentioned about the use of frontier technologies in disaster risk reduction and disaster risk management is very, very important, especially when you have a large uh, disasters. Uh, this is very, very important in the very steep and high altitude and rugged topography and some flooded areas where we cannot really go or reach these kind of frontier technologies are always important. So we thought that uh, to invite uh, our esteemed speakers to share their experiences in this field uh, in different perspective, uh, research perspective, applied uh, perspective, application perspective, knowledge generation perspective, community participation and training and awareness perspective. So this is the, you know, multitude of uh, uses of these frontier technologies in these days. So to do that, we have invited our uh, five speakers today and they are professional in their field and they are very renowned in their field, not only in Nepal, but also around the globe. Uh, as Suraj already mentioned that uh, you can post your questions and comments to a Zoom chat box and Facebook page, please write the presenter name to whom you want to ask. And the question should be very specific. So, uh, uh, and please do not write anything, do not annotate anything during the presentation from your machine. Otherwise it will be taken as an offensive act. Please remember that to make us the presentation uh, nice and flow smoothly. So in this context, I would like to invite all our speakers and participants for today. And uh, in the beginning, uh, I would like to invite 
engineer uh, Uttam Purasaini, uh, who is a tech entrepreneur and has been working on the application of geography in information system, ICT and frontier technologies like drones for social good uh, and the development since 2014. He's a founder of Noxa, a geospatial provider company, where he mainly conceptualizes ideas around the use of data and digital technologies for the development. Since the Nepal earthquake 2015, he has been leading drones for crisis mapping, disaster resilience, and improved public health initiative with his engagement as a director of Nepal Flying Labs, a national chapter of International Flying Labs Network. He is also the co-founder of Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction, where he mostly looks after the technologies in DRR and YAM initiative with the core belief that technology and innovation can significantly contribute to more job opportunities and development of Nepal. Uttam has been working in localizing uh, uh, these technologies in Nepal. So Uttam has six and a half years experiences of working with cutting his technologies for social good and development in rural communities of Nepal together with development agencies, civil societies and private institutions. So currently he's leading the technical team at Nepal Flying Labs in implementing a first its kind of drone for tuberculosis diagnosis project in rural Nepal together with local and international organizations. So his team also won the AUBSI Excellence Humanitarian Operation Award 2018 for the improvement disaster risk reduction that his team carried out with international partners, uh, mid-years and uh, uh, terrasins after the Nepal earthquake. So he has lots of experiences on this and uh, is very well known uh, researchers or practitioners uh, in Nepal. So today he's going to present on frontier technologies in disaster risk man reduction and management. So I would like to welcome engineer Uttam Pudasaini, the virtual flow engineers. Uh, thank you, Basanta sir. Am I audible? Yes, absolutely. Please. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and namaste. So I am a GIS uh, professional by education. And in my presentation today, I will be mainly sensitizing about uh, the importance of frontier technology in disaster risk reduction and management. There are also some of the case studies uh, of the work that I have done in the past, uh, mainly after the Nepal earthquake. So before going into the core uh, subject matter of my presentation, I would like to start with a story of myself. So back in 2016, I got an opportunity to work as a GIS consultant in a VCA mapping project. So that was somewhere in Tarai, in one of the municipalities in Tarai district. And this is what I witnessed uh, while I was working there. So the members of the community, they were invited and they were asked to create a map of their community by drawing on, on the ground surface. And in some of the areas, they were also making the uh, pictures of their community and also the map of the community on a chart paper. So being a GIS professional, I realized uh, uh, that uh, something was missing on it because the data set were being prepared by a very interesting participatory approach, but the data set were not being saved anywhere. So as a result, I was wondering if I could make any contribution to make this a little better because I was already working as a GIS professional. So what I did was uh, uh, by keeping the approach uh, the same, that means by maintaining the participatory approach and, and by uh, fully understanding the importance of the participatory approach. So instead of making the participants draw the map of their community on a ground, uh, what we did was um, we, made them, um, we made them locate the community infrastructures on a satellite image. And we didn't, I, I personally noticed that the workshop was very interesting because the participants were so excited to see the aerial imageries of their area. And as a result, instead of uh, maps like this, maps on ground and maps on paper, we were able to create a digital map uh, data set. So one copy of the digital data were also saved on GIS format. And there was also a community map that could be interpreted and read by the community. So that is how I got um, interested in working on digital technologies mainly for disaster risk reduction and management sector. 
so let me go into my uh, topic of presentation today frontier technology for disaster uh, risk reduction and management so i found this very interesting uh, report that was prepared by un desa back in 2018 so i am copying a picture and also the definition of frontier uh, technology from that report so frontier technology is not just just one particular type or piece of technology it is a broad collection of the newest uh, disruptive technologies that are easily replicable and adaptable so that means if a technology is prepared in nepal it can be used any anywhere around the globe and often time people call it with different names so some of the people and uh, professionals and researchers they say it's frontier technology while also the terminology is like uh, disruptive technology or emerging technology and frontier tech is also often used as a synonym to frontier technologies and if you look about um, if you look around like what are the different types of frontier technologies available in the market uh, these days so different organizations have their own category of frontier technologies and different organizations have identified a different kind of frontier technology so this is also a report which was prepared by escap back in 2016 together with multiple other partners and if you look on the table on the left hand side so the most common frontier technologies that have been uh, that is being practiced by different organizations are like artificial intelligence uh, robotics 3d printing Uh, internet of things and and so many other different kind of technologies so these are like the list of emerging frontier technologies around the globe and in my uh, presentation today i will be mainly focusing on uh, two of these different kind of uh, frontier technology because i have a first hand experience working on uh, both of these type of technology so i will be talking about how drones can be used in different phases of drrm and also how virtual reality can be used in uh, drrm education and also trainings so uh, just starting with the basic of the drones uh, the drones are on manned uh, on manned vehicles uh, that can fly based on the pre inter program or on its own recognition of the surrounding so the drones can be either remotely controlled or they are like semi autonomous or autonomous and the reason why drones are very popular is because they are very quickly deployable technology and it does not require a rocket science engineering or like a flying uh, does not require a very technical expertise to uh, handle a drone uh, flight project and also the drones are popular because they can fit different types of camera and sensor and as a result they help in data collection um, during a disaster and emergency situation within a very uh, short amount of time and this is this picture here it shows uh, why the drone technology is very interesting in and disaster risk reduction and management sector so one of the major reason as the picture shows here is you know like this is a picture that was captured during a flood in tanzania by one of my colleague who is working at tanzania flying lab so the picture on the left hand side it's a satellite image and as you can see on the satellite image it's cloud cover so the ground object is not visible while on the right hand side the ground object is very visible and also you can see uh, where the water has been is being deposited around the community so one of the main reason why the drone technology is popular in drrm is because they can fly below the cloud and also like they can provide better situational awareness so there is another example from nepal earthquake i captured these images while i was working at a build change as a frontier technology consultant after the nepal earthquake so on the top right hand side it's an image of a community in sindhu palchok district as it is visible on google earth and on the left hand side it's an image that is captured from drones so by looking at these two images you can compare how clear and accurate the picture from a drone is so during a disaster situation a drone image it provides better situational awareness and what's happening on the ground kind of information so if i have to categorize the use of drones in different phases of disaster then um, i can classify it on the basis of different phases of disaster so if you talk about the pre disaster situation then as surat ji showed earlier in his uh, uh, remarks in his welcome remarks so drones can be used to create high resolution and updated maps of some of the urban clusters so let's take example of kathmandu like places like thomel so the accurate map of the thomel can be captured with the help of drones but if you rely on satellite image then it might be difficult for us to uh, distinguish 
and the ground object because they are they are very close to each other so talking about a during disaster situation and these are the two images one is from one is of a landslide on a highway and that is captured by our partner drone nepal and the other image i i can downloaded it from internet so it's that is an image of an earthquake damaged uh, community so what drone does is without putting the first responders at risk it can fly very close to a disaster situation and it can help us provide um real time information of what's happening over there so if we need to do a close range damage inspection of a community whether it's a earthquake affected community or a landslide affected area the drones helps to provide to provide very accurate information of such location and uh, talking about the post uh, disaster situation and uh, the drone technology is also very useful uh, during the post uh, disaster situation because it helps to conduct a post disaster need assessment so this is a project we did with our partner uh, medier back in after the nepal earthquake so there were um, houses being built and our partner had to do a remote monitoring of the reconstruction activity so we did a small pilot initiative where we flew drone over the area and they were building the houses and by collecting the high resolution imagery we were able to track the progress of uh, construction so the same uh, technology and process can also be applied in any kind of uh, reconstruction process uh, project after a disaster situation so these are the quick uh, applications of uh, drone technology in different uh, phases of disaster and if you are interested to learn further about uh, how the drone technology is being used across the globe then there is this very interesting book uh, that is uh, published by several different partners uh, its name is drones in humanitarian action and the book drones in humanitarian action it has a um, it has a example of uh, use of drones in different humanitarian context across the globe so you can download this book online and you can look on what different kind of projects uh, has been done around the globe regarding the use of drones in humanitarian context and uh, so i would like to highlight one more thing before i go into my uh, second uh, type of frontier technology so flying a drone these days has become very easier so anyone can buy a drone from the market and they can just immediately fly the drone but as a disaster uh, risk reduction practitioner uh, one thing that we need to consider is during a disaster situation there are so many actors working on the ground so all these actors are there working on the ground with different purposes so what we need to consider is the code of conduct needs to be properly followed so if we are a drone um, a professional flying a drone in a disaster context so what we need to do is there is an international code of conduct you can find it online as well so that was pre prepared by my organization uh, flying lab with robotics together with 70 80 other humanitarian organization so we have to follow the code of conduct so that whenever any drone projects uh, uh, we do during a disaster situation we have to make sure that the ethical code of conduct is uh, properly followed so that there is a responsible as well as ethical collection of data so these are the different application of uh, drone technology and talking about the second type of uh, frontier technology so virtual reality is another emerging um, technology which also has very interesting example in disaster risk reduction we have a very interesting speaker today uh, who will be sharing more about it but i i, I just want to highlight uh, one project that my team did after the nepal earthquake so um, first let let me quickly define what virtual reality is so virtual reality is the use of uh, computer technology to create a simulated uh, environment and a simulated experience so unlike other traditional user interface the vr places the user inside an experience so that means instead of viewing a screen in front of ourselves what happens is we get immersed uh, inside a virtual world and inside the virtual world we can interact with a different object and as a result the learning process becomes so much interactive and also we can you know like grasp a lot of thing because we are experiencing uh, the experience ourselves so in disaster risk reduction and management we have been trying to introduce some of the vr related project so the virtual reality is very interesting in disaster risk reduction and management and there are three major type of applications that is very relevant and suitable so the first is basic drrm education so for example if i am conducting any 
fire drilling exercise and the normal way the traditional way in which a fire drilling exercise happens is uh, people are invited to a place and they are taught by one uh, fire expert uh, regarding the different components of how they deal with a fire situation but if the same thing was done in a virtual reality environment what happens is uh, the user all of the users and all of the participants of the training they get to experience a virtual environment where a fire is happening and they get to use different kind of hardware and software devices so that they can you know like get a first hand understanding of and first hand experience on how they could control the fire in a real environment so it makes the drrm education very interesting and and in fact a lot of uh, international organizations and and foreign countries for example in australia and us and mostly in california and also on many part of australia they use virtual reality in uh, fire response trainings as well and also there is one another very interesting application that i got to experience while i was participating in an event in malaysia so psychotherapy psychotherapy is another application of virtual reality so for example if i am someone uh, affected uh, during a disaster situation and if i have lost i mean like sense of something or if i have some like psychological problem so uh, there are so many different virtual reality games outside there who helps to boost which helps to boost your morals so the virtual reality also has such kind of applications and the reason why virtual reality is very uh, interesting in drrm there are four main different reason so one is it's very safe it's very safe because there is no any physical setup that you need to make it's also cost effective compared to other traditional disaster drill training that we organize and also it's very tailored you know like we can set up different customized modules and customized games and if we make the user uh, participate and play those games then they can have a very interesting experience and also it is very efficient and scalable so the same training package that you do in kathmandu you can take it outside of kathmandu and you can have the user experience it so uh, there is one example that i want to show uh, this is a work we did with uh, build sense nepal we have nirmal ji from uh, build sense today so this example is mainly for retrofitting education so while i was working there as a uh, frontier technology consultant so one thing i noticed was can you see the video on my screen there is a video playing no we don't see the video but we can see the house mm -hmm. there is a video uh, it was supposed to play let me yeah but you can just click the arrow and enter the room inside okay can can you see it now yes can we see the video now uh, no 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 we don't see that okay so i actually had two different videos uh let me show it online then how can i change my screen uh okay i think i can show it now uh can you see it now mm, yes. yes yes okay so uh sorry for that technical problem so this is a what we did was like after the nepal earthquake a lot of building were being retrofitted and the first thing that we need to needed to do was uh, we needed to teach the people about the importance of retrofitting and how retrofitting happens in a real environment so what we did was like instead of going to communities and giving them long theoretical presentation uh, so build chains develop this uh, uh, interactive platform where you can go inside a house and understand the retrofitting process by interacting with the objects over there so for example you can click on the wall over here as you can see like there are two different options so one option is revit model and another option is revit model structure and if you click on that a uh, particular bubble then it tells you uh, what kind of additional elements has been added on the building so uh, this example is is to demonstrate how uh, virtual reality and and this experience can help in better learning and teaching experience so this video is also available online and if you want to see further uh, you can go to the website that i have mentioned on my slide and the website you can have this first level of uh, experience yourself by going to the website and 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 
uh, viewing that output. Uh, let me go back to my uh, presentation. Okay, so there is also another video, but I think uh, with technical problem, I should not uh, go for it. So if you want to uh, see this, you can go to noxa.com.np slash vtour vtour and you can have this immersive experience yourself as well. So there is also this another interesting video that I found online and you can check it later. So this is a fire safety training module, which is completely developed in a virtual environment. So you can go into the module and you can learn how the fire uh, response training can be given in a virtual in a reality environment in a more uh, safer way. So these are the two different applications that I wanted to highlight uh, during this short session today. So before I end my presentation, I would like to share two more uh, slides. So I was looking online and I was searching on the current state of the current market condition of the virtual reality. And the graph here, it shows the venture capital investment by technology. And if you look at the six major technology where majority of investment is being made. So it's virtual reality, robotics and drones, AI and machine learning. These are some of the thematic areas where huge investment is being made. So I think uh, for a country like Nepal, we are, where, uh, we are a disaster, we are in a, a very disaster prone situation. And in terms of earthquake, fire and other different kind of disaster, Nepal is a disaster prone country. So just like the example of VCA, if we could introduce a new different kind of digital technology, then I think our path to resilience will be uh, much more shorter. And also there is another, this interesting statistics, which I often show in my presentation. So back in 1995, we only had 50 internet users. But if we look at our statistics now, so the number of internet mobile subscription, it's actually greater than the total population of the country. So that means Nepal is not backward in terms of technology adaptation. And I think if we adapt this kind of frontier technologies in disaster risk reduction, then our path to disaster resilience will be much more uh, shorter. Thank you for listening. So if you have any questions, we can like discuss at the end. Uh, thank you, uh, Engineer Uttam Purasaini, and you have presented uh, the overarching view uh, the importance of the uh, frontier technologies, including UAV, VR, and for example, other augmented reality in disaster risk reduction and management. Uh, of course, there will be some questions later on that uh, we will take after the presentation in Q&A session. Please uh, try to see uh, the comments uh, or questions in the Zoom chat box. I will address there. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Uttam Prasani once again. Uh, now, I would like to invite uh, our next speaker, uh, which is Associate Professor Rijan Bhakta Kaista. He's a well-known uh, glaciologist uh, working uh, in the Highland. He has a 25 experiences on the Himalayan glaciology, glaciohydrogeology, modeling, and mountain hydrology and meteorology. His higher education, MSc and DSc and GSPS postdoc was from Nagoya University, Japan and Max Planck postdoc from Max Planck Institute uh, uh, for Biogeochemistry, Germany. His research areas includes understanding of glacier mass balance by field and modeling techniques, impact of climate change, impact on the glaciers and water resources, understanding of glacial variation by field observation, remote sensing and modeling techniques, estimation of ablation by energy balance and positive degree day models, estimation of current and future discharge from the glaciated river basins using different glacial hydrological models and future climate data, glacial climate interaction, snow and glacial hydrology of mountain region, extreme weather events, glacial hazards such as glacial lake outburst flood, flood or glove early warning system and water and climate-induced disaster risk reduction uh, in the mountainous region. He has developed a glacier mass balance model and glacial hydrological degree day model, which is known as GDA model. These two major projects are the Chrysphere Monitoring Project, CMP, since 2011, 
supported by the Royal Norwegian government through the International Center for Integrated Mount, Mountain Development, ECMOD, and contribution of high Asia runoff from the ice and snow since 2012, supported by USAID through the University of Colorado at Boulder, USA, uh, which was completed in September 2018. He is also a NASA HIMAT uh, project team leader uh, in which he has contributed to the GDM model. So he's a well-known glaciologist, and uh, not only in Nepal, but also around the globe. And today he's going to present uh, how can we use a uh, drone for glacial mapping. Um, so I would like to invite uh, Associate Professor Regent Dr. Kasta, the virtual floor is yours. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Basanta sir, and all other participants. I think I have seen uh, Ramesh sir also present as a participant. So, namaste to all. And first of all, I would like to thank this uh, ISRR, Institute of Himalayan Risk Reductions, for inviting me uh, for today's presentations on drones for glacial mapping. Uh, so this IHRR is also very much related with our center, what we call High CCDRC, Himalayan Cryosphere Climate and Disaster Research Center, because we are also working on this uh, Himalayan, of course, cryosphere, snow and ice, permafrost, and disaster. So let's start today's presentation on drones for glacier mapping. First. Uh, Okay, first, let's see. Uh, okay, so uh, let's start with the uh, use of UAV drones on man aerial vehicle on glaciological studies. So where we can use the drones in glacier studies. The first one is the mapping of glacier and glacier features. And these mapping will give us downwesting of glacier how much glacier ice was melted out, or it's how the surface is lowering on that glacier, and flow velocity, because all glaciers, that glacier in Nepali we call Himnadi, so it's a flowing body of snow and ice. Therefore, we can also find out flow velocity of that glacier by comparing the two images and change in supra glacier ponds and glacier lakes. So this glacier mapping or the glacial features will also be useful to know the changes in supra glacier ponds. Supra glacier ponds are the small ponds inside the glacier and glacier lakes are a little larger one because we can also differentiate from ponds and lakes. So lakes are usually larger ones. And in case of Nepal, we have pro glacier lakes in front of the glacier and land surface surface temperature mapping also so we can use the drones or the uavs for the land surface temperature mapping and that will be used for that will be used for uh, knowing the glacier feature or uh, to use how the glacier will melt and then the monitoring of glacier carving. So there's some glaciers may be connected with uh, lake water or the sea, and those connected part may be carving. It's a wasting into that lake or in the water. So that also we can done using these uh, drones in different ways. And so before going in details, let's see where our most glaciers are studied. So these are the different six regions, six basins, where the glacier is, glacier has been studied since 1970s, we can say. Panchanjanga, Khumbu, Sorong, Langtang, Manang, and Taulagiri. So these are the major six regions where the glaciers have been studied in case of Nepal. And even in those river basins, not all glaciers have been studied, only few. And so these are the 19 glacierized sub-river basins of Nepal where we have to concentrate on our 
these uh, drones for mapping glacier and glacier lakes. These are the different from east to west, Kamur, Arun, Dutkoshi, Liku, and up to Mahakali. And now use of UAV in Nepal. So in case of Nepal, the first uh, UAV was used in October 2015 in Lantang Valley. At the time, as uh, the, uh, before the Sor has also mentioned that we have, uh, I was involved in the two major projects, CMP, which is already completed, uh, both have completed, I think. In CMP crash monitoring project, we have a partner, the Utrecht University from Netherlands and Ishimut is also a main uh, partner uh, in that project. Through Ishimut, we have received uh, some uh, portion of that Ishim, uh, project. And we have done uh, this uh, drone mapping of this Lirung Glacier in Langtang. So uh, Langtang is here and li this is Lirung Glacier. This is the Abdesen Valley of the Lirung Glacier. And here we can see some little water. And so these are the different art mosaics of that uh, Lirung Glacier. Glacier is Fisher Tong is here. And here we can see a uh, lots of debris and ice inside. And this is the, uh, the dam created by using that uh, UAV flight, UAV survey. So this was the first in Nepal uh, use of UAV for the glacier mapping. And then in the next year, they have also used the UAV for uh, the again repeated uh, survey in May 2016. In this case, they have used two sensors, optical sensors and uh, thermal. Thermal is uh, this one. Thermal means it will give the surface temperature so that we can find out where the uh, temperature is high. So where, if the temperature is high, then that portion will have higher melting. And the, one, the next one is the optical one. So with these, they have uh, found some downward thing or the glacier melt rate, and which was uh, around 60 centimeter per year. Uh, 0.6 meter per year and they have already published uh, this work also. So here what we can see is these red parts from here. So this is the glacier depth. Glacier depth, uh, red parts are higher melted parts and these uh, blue parts are not melted or in some case it is increased, its surface elevation increased. Those surface increase may be due to some local movements, not from, because we, we can see this glacier is not moving much. And these, some little increase in the surface elevations is due to the local one. It's not from the upper part. So such uh, information we can get using the two times drone images using some DSM that I will show you in the next slide. Also. And before also there was a question about the permissions. So here I can, uh, show you some uh, permit processes at the time. And this was in uh, started, we have started the drone permit uh, from 2015. So at the time we have to get uh, from the, since it is from the uh, area in the national park, we have to get from the DNPWC. It's, uh, uh, it's a department of wildlife uh, and national park and wildlife conservation. So after getting from there, uh, permission, then we have to get from the civil aviation can also as a no time. And then since our study area are inside the national park, so we have to get from the Nepali army also, Nepal army also, we have to get like these uh, permits in order to have a UAV flights in those areas, which we have done in the beginning. And uh, not only the, the Netherlands and the Ishimo team, and the Japanese team from uh, Nagoya University is also using the uh, drone for glacier mapping and glacier lake mapping. And the first that they have done in October 2016 in the Rolwaling Valley in Dolakha district, where we have uh, the biggest glacier lake of Nepal. This is the Chorulpa Glacier Lake. And they have uh, planned to uh, carry out UAV survey. This post, this is Trakarding Glacier, we call it. It's a debris covered. And the upper part is, this is the Trambau Glacier, which is a clean glacier. So they have uh, done some UAV 
flights in October 2016, as well as after that also, they are doing some uh, UAV flights. Not only ETA, they have also done uh, in Langtang also. Uh, as we all know, this, uh, due to this uh, Gorkha earthquake in 2015, there was a huge, uh, huge uh, uh, ice avalanche, ice, snow, rock avalanche from this area, and it was uh, devastated the whole Langtang uh, village. And after that, they came here and they uh, carried out some UAV flight observations from these different areas to map these are the flights of their UAV flights during that time, October uh, 23rd in 2015. Yeah, 2015. Please. And this is in June, they also carried out. And this is May, these are from the other. Uh, images, not the drone. Drones are the only the upper part. So they have also studied in details using the drone for uh, this uh, uh, long tongue ice sense rock avalanche. And in case of from the Nepalese side, uh, the Punkar Glacier in Manang, Nepal by the ICC DRCK. So we have carried out this Punkar Glacier mapping using the drones. Uh, in this uh, cryospheric study, because at the time we have a one project series. So through that project, we have started some glaciological uh, observations on this glacier. And this is the location map of Punkur Glacier in Manang, Nepal here, Manang district, and in the Manang district also in the uh, northeastern part, we have this Punkur Glacier. This is the main Punkur Glacier. And this is the lower part, Appleton part, and Akinosan area is very high up, high up here. And uh, on this uh, uh, river basin, so we have installed temperature and precipitation uh, gauges, Tarapani, Goa, Yakharka, Imtang, and on the and on the modern side. So these four were the temperature and precipitation loggers, and two AWS automatic weather stations at Imtang and on the glacier itself. So these were our uh, settings. Also, we have kept some uh, addition stakes on this glacier. Sixteen, we have carried out UAP survey. This is our AWS on the glacier side, and this is nearby uh, the Pimtang uh, Lodge. And we have carried out some high visual measurements on this Dutkola also. And this is the temperature and precipitation uh, sensors. And we drilled like this ice because this is the debris. Okay. And ice is a little down, about uh, 20, 30 centimeter down. We have to clear the uh, debris and then we drill like this. We have drills by hand at the time. Now we have some uh, mechanical motor also. And uh, during that, uh, UAB survey. First, we carried out in March 2016. This is the uh, just a few uh, uh, surveys, and because at the time we have used this uh, DJI uh, Phantom 2, so we uh, we couldn't cover a wide area due to some uh, technical problem as well as uh, high altitude. Also, its altitude is around uh, 4,000 meters. Eh? And in the July. We have uh, took some uh, extra batteries, so we covered a little uh, higher area. And then comparing these uh, two uh, images, and then we found that the total ice melt was at two uh, debris thicknesses. So in the thinner debris thickness, the melting will be higher. At the debris thickness of 11 centimeter, the melt during these two periods from 25 March to 5 July 2016 was 94 centimeter, but at the depth of 20 centimeter debris, the melt was 68 centimeter, and the average was these values. So such things we can also get using UAV surveys in case of glacier studies. And then in 2018, so we again went there, and we at the time we used uh, a fixed wing and this uh, drone. And we also carried out some uh, GPR surveys 
and this is the GPS service uh, location map. And with uh, these are the flight uh, paths. We have carried out uh, about three, three, two times, one, two, three, one, two, three, in October, May, October, 2018 and 19. And with these uh, images, in case of October, 2016, this is the DC, uh, uh, digital surface models, this portion, and this is the second uh, times, second attempts. So we compare these two, and by comparing these two, we found such uh, changes here. Uh, so with these, we found some average ice melt, and average ice melt was 66 uh, centimeter from November 2016 to May 2017. So, and not only the surface loading, we can also see some expansion of this is we called uh, supragressive pond. So the pond's expansion also we can uh, monitor using UAV flights. And so as I have already showed that we have 19 subglacial reverberations from East to West Nepal, but we have carried out only two, three reverberations like in Kumbu also, IRD France, as well as the University of South Florida also carried out some drone surveys, as well as in the Langtang, they have carried out. Uh, we have carried out in Manang, but in other areas, no one has carried out. So we need to expand the use of UAVs for the glacier and glacial lake studies in different reverberations so that we will have a good information as well as the good knowledge how the glacier are changing in this changing climate conditions. With this, I would like to conclude my short presentations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Rizan Dr. Kaista, um, for your wonderful presentation. As we all know that uh, these Himalayan glaciers and glacial lakes are very important in terms of understanding global uh, climate change uh, and also in terms of the risks that uh, uh, people might face or facing uh, in these days, not only in the Nepal Himalaya, but also uh, in the whole mountain uh, Himalayan arc, uh, 20, 2400 kilometer mountain Himalayan arc. So this is very, very important and uh, uh, use of these technologies UAB technologies or other frontier technologies are very important because these glacial lakes and glacier are really in the high altitude and very, very difficult to reach so that uh, these uh, technologies can provide us the uh, you know really important information which we can proceed, process in the computer modeling. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Kaista. Uh, I hope there are uh, questions uh, in the Zoom chat box. Please uh, go through it. We'll uh, address them at the end of the uh, presentation in Q&A session. Thank you very much once again. Um, now I would like to invite uh, uh, our next speaker, uh, engineer uh, Darpan Purasaini. He's a tech entrepreneur uh, who has been working for almost a decade in innovating solutions to social problems with the frontier technologies like sensors uh, and embedded systems, IoT, robotic system, 3D printing, extended reality, AI and drones with the core belief that youth and technology together, we are the answer to minimizing the technological, developmental and social divides. He has been working in the capacity building and technology and skill transfer with an aim to aid in the development of uh, sustainable solution of, of real world problems. From the past four years, he has been working extensively with advocacy, sensitization and capacity building in the use of drone in humanitarian response and infrastructure development in Southeast Asia and has been providing training to the national, international and uh, both governmental and non-governmental agencies uh, as well as the youth. And he's a really good to people uh, for young and uh, youth uh, in Nepal and abroad. So today uh, he is going to present on use of extended reality in disaster risk reduction. So engineer Darpan Prasani, the virtual room is yours. Please proceed.
Suraj, can you just close the screen sharing? Uh, okay. So, Darpan, you can go ahead, please. Uh, thank you so much, Vasanta, sir. Uh, namaste, everyone. Uh, please allow me a few seconds so I can share my screen with you. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, please open your video as well, if possible. Just a moment. Hello? Yes, it's perfect now. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for this wonderful opportunity in presenting today. Um, so I would like to directly jump into my topic of presentation because absent from that, we'll be having Q&A session later on where we can discuss a lot of things. Uh, so in today's webinar that uh, has been given to us for you know presenting about frontier technologies, I have chosen to present specifically about extended reality technology. So our early presenter- Can you make a full screen, please? Can you make a full screen of presentation? Uh, is it okay now, sir? Yes. Uh, okay, so earlier, Mr. Uttam Pradasani had already discussed about virtual reality and augmented reality a bit. And actually the topic of my presentation is also exactly extended reality, uh, but we'll be discussing a bit further. Uh, we'll dive a bit deeper into the topic. So the topic today is extended reality in DRRM. Uh, today we'll be discussing firstly something about DRRM. Now uh, I'm present in front of the audience who are already an expert in DRRM, who have been working for multiple years in DRRM. So I won't be going further into DRRM, but just few aspects of DRRM. And then uh, I'll try to jump straight into disaster training and disaster response and how we can make use of extended reality technologies in those fields. And then we'll discuss uh, what is extended reality as a whole, and then we'll move into a few example applications of how they have been used. So first, uh, talking about DRRM, um, I think it's evident that you know there are four distinct stages in DRRM: preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. And of those four stages, the first two stages, that's preparedness and response, uh, these specific two um, stages pertain to uh, you know, the efforts uh, that are made actually to lessen the impact of disasters. So, uh, while these components contain lots of constituents itself, I will only be discussing about few of the components that pertain to extended reality, uh, which are simulation, training, information, and coordination. So we'll uh, dig a bit uh, deeper into it uh, later on. So let's first go into disaster training. So we all know that disaster training is a very crucial part of disaster preparedness, right? Uh, we talk about resiliency, we talk about everything, but training is one aspect that has been given much more significance till date. And also the quality, consistency, and frequency of those kinds of trainings highly impacts the disaster readiness of any place. Or let's say, let's rephrase it like this. So we have lots of disaster response teams and organizations working worldwide. And even in Nepal, we have lots of organizations working in the field. But in order to ensure that their work is much more impactful and disaster ready, the quality, consistency, and frequency, all these three aspects of the trainings need to be emphasized. Till date, we have three generic models of uh, providing trainings, or let's say capacity building in terms of disaster preparedness. The first one is classroom teaching, and then we have web-based training, and there are also real life drills and tabletop exercises. So talking about classroom teaching, these teachings are the uh, traditional hypothetical style or educational style teachings where people are gathered in a classroom and then they are provided with classroom materials, which they study and inspect in order to gain the skills and knowledge required for disaster preparedness. So this is one of the oldest traditional means of uh, training in DRRM. Then we also have web-based training. 
uh, as we were moving into the knowledge era, uh, the, we saw the evolution of web-based training. So it's most evident because we can see it uh, in almost all organizations these days. And this is also beneficial over classroom teaching because uh, people are now able to learn at their own pace and they can learn from their own homes and everything. But there's this uh, disadvantage with classroom teaching as well as web-based training. They, they both lack interactivity and they both lack realism. So as long as the objective of the training is to provide knowledge and information uh, to the trainees, they are perfect in working, but they fail in providing the realistic uh, scenarios and they fail in providing the simulations to the participants. Uh, so we also have the third type of training that is real life drills and tabletop exercises. So these exercises have been practiced for over lots of decades and these are actually the ones uh, that the people rely on for ensuring that uh, disaster preparedness trainings are effective. But the thing with these kinds of drills and exercises is that they are really time and resource heavy. So it's also like resource heavy in terms of cost as well as equipment. Uh, for instance, if we take example of Nepal, uh, it's almost in, impossible, not impossible, but it's almost impractical to carry forth such kinds of real life drills and exercises in Nepal you know, for all the organizations that are working in the DRM space, specifically because of the resource and capital limitations. And also these exercises are hard to scale. So what it means is like, you know, if, even if we are successfully, uh, even if we successfully create a lab or a space where we can provide uh, real life trainings uh, using very heavy equipments and stuff like that, we actually cannot scale it to other parts of the country, let alone to other parts of the world, right? So it's really hard to scale and it's also less accessible because only the people or only the places uh, that are highly, that have high access of uh, electricity, transportation, and other IT infrastructures can only access such uh, drills and exercises. Most of such exercises, not all. And then there's this uh, most significant factor, which is uh, there's always a chance for human risk in such drills and exercises. So uh, I just highlighted the limitations, but uh, even apart from these limitations, there's this uh, the requirements, right? So we can provide uh, through any kind of trainings, we can provide skills and knowledge to participants, but we are talking about scenarios where people have to uh, respond quickly. Uh, their reflex has to be good and people have to have a very accurate sense of decision making, right? So also the psychological state of their mind comes into play in such trainings, uh, which are actually not uh, given priority till date in most of the trainings and also uh, the person has to be confident in a specific scenario. For example, if I, I have been trained inside a room for fire responding, and if I go to the uh, actual scenario where disaster is happening and I see lots of people screaming, then definitely my efficiency and the rate of my, the rate of the impact of my work drastically reduces, right? And it's also imperative to have as lesser elements of surprise as possible. So what I mean from this is like, as a disaster responder or as a emergency responder, I need to have you know, calculated and gone through all the possible scenarios in my training so that I can be effective in the field, field itself, right? So these are also uh, significant aspects of training uh, in disaster preparedness, but uh, these are actually you know, ignored in lots of trainings. So enter virtual reality. Uh, virtual reality, so, I don't think I need to explain what's virtual reality, but we'll talk about it later also. So what virtual reality actually does is it combines the education or the traditional means of imparting knowledge and skills with realism and interactivity. So the person actually does not see or hear information, but actually participates in the process. So it's like, uh, for instance, if I'm watching a video of someone responding fire, then I can see that a third person is you know, specifically taking certain actions in order to uh, follow the procedures. But if I am using the VR headset and I'm in the training or simulation myself, I'm not, uh, I'm no longer watching any third person do the activity, but I will be myself doing the activity in first person. So this greatly enhances the realism and interactivity by the use of virtual reality. So it also enhances the psychological capacity and decision making. 
So like I told earlier, if I am already uh, presented with real life and realistic scenarios while uh, I'm in my training process, then I will have better capacity to cope with the psychological effects uh, during disasters and I'll have better decision making. And also it reduces the elements of surprise like we have discussed. Uh, this also adds uh, the functionality of ability to learn at my own pace uh, because in cases of real life drills and exercises, we have to organize uh, the trainings at certain specific places where there are equipments, there are lots of trained professionals. So it's not, uh, you know, it's not really feasible for the participants to really learn at their own, uh, own rates. But if uh, they have, uh, if they have the facility of training in VR, then they can actually learn at their own paces. They can actually study each and every element and each and every procedure of the training. Uh, so gamification is also possible. So what it means is like uh, these days, even into education and training and everything, gamification has been a crucial concept, uh, especially in this decade. So instead of just participating in some games, sorry, in some video or training, what it does is, you know, there's a system of reward, there's a system of punishment, and I can actually, you know, not just uh, interact with the environment, but I can also have points. For, uh, so it really increases the realism of the game and it really, uh, increases the immersiveness of the training as well. And finally, uh, in the same aspect, just like uh, it's the case with the chess game, where a chess player can be trained to think like multiple states ahead for each and every move, the same can be done in case of preparedness training, which is really crucial. Uh, the second significant thing that VR adds on to the emergency preparedness training is how easy it is to use. Although this is a very complex technology that has only been around for a few years, uh, the user interface and the user experiences are drastically being so easy that even child. So basically the VR uh, technology revolved around games and education and classrooms. So they are actually designed so that a child, even a 10 year old child or 18 year old child can even use it easily. So the ease of use is a huge factor in VR training. Uh, then also it can be tailored to the specific needs of the organizations uh, because it's also scalable and it's also, you know, virtual in a sense. Uh, it's really feasible to, you know, redesign the whole environment or we can place few, um, we can place few components of the training itself to suit the individual requirement of any organization or community and like that. And also it's really scalable. Uh, I think Uttam has also mentioned in his presentation that uh, these frontier technologies, they have this capacity that even if we develop uh, these technologies in the farthest nooks and corners of the world, and if they actually work, then we can scale it to any part of the world, right? So this it's really scalable. And once you create a training, then you can easily customize the training for any organization or even different countries and different geographies. So it's really scalable. And it also comes with the possibility of integration with a diverse environment. So it might sound redundant, but what I mean by this is like, uh, for instance, what we can do is, you know, uh, offer a virtual reality training for fire responding at different situations. For instance, fire responding when it's the winter season, fire responding at summer season, fire responding when it's heavily raining, right? Fire, is, uh, fire responding when uh, there's a huge storm coming in way. So we can, uh, design such dynamic environments and the people can be, you know, uh, run over through the same tra trainings uh, in different environments. So this possibility is there with the VR or extended reality. And it also opens up a whole new level of cross collaboration platforms uh, because people can, you know, train at the same time from multiple parts of the globe and people from different parts of the disaster response, like um, can also, you know, integrate the training together so that uh, they can train like first responders can be in constant connection with uh, uh, GIS analysts, uh, for example. So this enables cross collaborations and it also allows testing of emergency response plans. So these days um, I have seen that, you know, lots of organizations, almost all the organizations already have their emergency response plans in place, but they actually never get to test it out unless some disaster happens. And that's not really ideal because the idea is to have a solid foolproof plan, right? So in VR and in AR, we can actually test the emergency response plan in different scenarios 
and also append the plan so we are ready to you know tackle the disaster or crisis situations so there are even lots more aspects to it but uh, these are some of the things that are relevant uh, when we're talking about disaster preparedness now let's talk about disaster response um, disaster response uh, you know so just like the uh, just like in disaster preparedness so we were focusing on disaster preparedness for training but in disaster response uh, the crucial part that comes or that can be augmented by using technology is uh, the impartion of or you know the easy flow of information and actually not just information but the whole process that allows the emergency responders and field responders to extract knowledge from that information uh, in disaster response scenarios First, it is really hard to convert information into knowledge because uh, everyone is crying and you know the situation might be like ongoing earthquake, for example. So it's a really hard situation where too much information can cause analysis paralysis, right? And also like um, information is only good if it's as in decision making, right? So just because we have lots of information doesn't mean that we can carry forth any project uh, successfully or efficiently. So we need to actually be able to convert the information into knowledge that can ultimately aid in decision making process because uh, even a second worth of decision can help decide saving lives right so in order to save all these uh, frustrations uh, augmented reality can be used so it's a bit different than virtual reality we'll be discussing a bit later about it but what it allows us to do is it allows us to augment real-time information with real world scene for an example if i'm an emergency responder and I'm going to uh, going to search and rescue certain person in an earthquake affected area uh, it's really hard for me to you know actually use gadget in one hand and keep on going in search and rescue mission so what I can do is you know making use of augmented reality glasses I can augment all the information available regarding uh, the known locations for instance working together with drones the drones can first identify uh, which houses are collapsed and I can have that interactive visualization in real time uh, in map where I need to go, right? So in this way, uh, in lots of disaster scenarios, augmented reality can be used. It enables hands-free access to information and it also enables cross, uh, sorry, cross uh, collaborations. So it's uh, just like I uh, mentioned earlier in virtual reality, what we can do is like, you know, we can pair the emergency response team with GIS analysis team and also the relief team and medical response team so that they can have a uh, closed loop of connection and they can be in real time connection with each other and also visualize information from one place and support. Uh, this has also been, you know, widely used in multiple contexts in multiple countries these days as well. So these are some of the applications that augmented reality uh, adds on to disaster response. Now I have been talking about uh, these jargons. Uh, sometimes I call extended reality sometimes i call it augmented reality and then i was calling it virtual reality at the same time uh, and there's also another term that's called mixed reality so let's uh, dive a bit into what these terms are so extended reality basically represents a diverse array of technologies so let's uh, imagine that there is this uh, continuum of reality and virtuality so what i mean is like you know there's reality in one place and there's completely virtual thing in another place right so there exists some technology that fall between the line or the continuum of reality and virtuality and these technologies are collectively known as extended reality or er in short form so uh, they have like three major components so first is augmented reality er then there is, we have mixed reality which is basically a combination of virtual reality and augmented reality to some degree and we have also extended reality, which is the fourth term that has been emerging these days that makes use of um, all the features from all these three AR, MR and VR technologies. So let's look into augmented reality first. Uh, augmented reality is basically, you know, it just adds, it's a technology that adds a layer of information to the world. Although it does not interact, uh, it does not necessarily interact with the world elements, it adds, in, uh, adds information. For example, uh, today, these days, we are using Facebook cameras and Instagram cameras, even Snapchat. We, we can use filters, right? Those filters, what they basically do is they add a layer of some animations or some stickers to our face. 
So this is like augmenting information to the real world scenario. That's basically augmented reality. And apart from the mobile phones uh, or the phone cameras that we have seen uh, that been used in augmented reality, there are also augmented reality glasses, but this technology is really in its baby step and uh, it's not market ready or consumer ready yet, but we are in the process of developing it, right? So it will get there sometime. And then we have virtual reality. So earlier, what augmented reality did is bring the virtual information into the real world. Now, what virtual reality does is takes us or takes the user into the virtual world. So if I wear a virtual reality headset, then I am completely, I completely lost the awareness of the world around me. And then I'm immersed into a completely virtual world. So this basically is like playing a virtual reality game. Uh, we might have all seen it in YouTube or even used it ourselves because uh, virtual reality is really popular and really accessible to people even in Nepal these days. So what it basically is does, uh, what it basically does is it takes a virtual world and put you inside it. So that's the basic concept. And then we have mixed reality. So what mixed reality uh, enables is like, you know, it enables the interaction between the real world and the virtual world. So what I can do is in my room, I can place a chair beforehand buying. So this is one of the early applications that is already on the market uh, in developed countries right now. Yeah, uh, we might have also seen lots of examples in YouTube and other video sharing platforms where uh, schools are using mixed reality platforms to teach students. Just like you can see in the image in right here, a uh, student is playing with a skeletal system and he can take apart all the organs and stuff like that. So this is basically mixed reality that allows us to create a virtual world and mix that information or the virtual world into real world scene. So this is basically a mixed reality. Um, and then here are a few example uses of extended reality. So some are using virtual reality some are using augmented reality and some are using mixed reality, but uh, all together, these are a few of the popular examples uh, that have been on this field. Uh, the Asia Pacific Disaster Resilience Center, APDRC in Korea, uh, I think in 2018, they created a small application which allowed users to make use of the virtual headset and you know get immersed into an environment that uh, presented either a fire scenario or uh, an earthquake scenario. So the person could actually, you know, be in the game itself and uh, have the real first-hand experience of how they need to behave. Although it was really early stage app, uh, it's considered as one of the most important steps in use of virtual reality in disaster response. And then we can see lots of other evident examples. Uh, for instance, LAPD uses virtual reality. They have been integrating it in their workflows for years now. And then there's this University of Illinois at Chicago so they have been using virtual reality for, you know, just like we saw earlier in the slide pertaining to mixed reality, they have been using it for health sector. And then we have like FEMA that's been using it. And then there are lots of other universities that you can see on the slides. And I'm sure that there are, there are tons of other universities and research institutions that are practicing it. Uh, so this pretty much uh, summarizes my slides. And before ending my slides, I would like to uh, present about two solutions that we ourselves have been you know, experimenting in Nepal for like two or three years and have been implementing it. So this first one is augmented reality terrain simulation platform, which we have named as ARTS. So it's basically based on like one or two decade old technology uh, that was called Sandbox AR, which is a discontinued project now. So we built upon that project to create this augmented reality training simulation. Uh, let me just show you the video first. So basically this is a four feet by three feet box that has white sand in it. And it has few sensors and projectors projecting at it. And you can see that in real time, whenever we just form or deform a terrain, uh, the device is able to you know, adapt to the new situation and it even overlays contour over it. And you can see that in places that are at depth, uh, water just flows into those areas. Now it's, uh, in a way, it's only useful in order to teach students about terrains, but it's really uh, important if we can integrate in trainings because it can provide uh, lots of skills uh, pertaining to terrain awareness, spatial awareness, and lots of things. And we are also trying to uh, add and increase the functionality of this device. So this is one active use of augmented reality. 
And then there's this another project uh, that we have been doing from last year. So it's called FIRST, uh, which full form is FIRST Responding Simulation and Training. So basically it's a virtual reality project where you can wear a virtual reality headset like Oculus Go or Oculus Quest. And what it allows is like, you know, there's a person lying on the floor and it uh, provides you the opportunity to save that person by giving CPR. So we have like two kinds of modes in it. One is simulation and one is training. In simulation, it just, uh, you know, shows a movie kind of thing to the person so they can, you know, have the first hand experience of how others or a third person responder can save other people. And we also have training module in it where people can play it like a game or they have to actually push using their own hands and try to match the heartbeat of the person in order to provide uh, CPR successfully and save the person. So this is one example of how we can uh, integrate technology and in first responding. So this is me, that's pretty much about me. Uh, I've been involved in robotics, IoT, and other frontier technologies like AI, drones, AR, VR for almost nine or 10 years now. Uh, so that's pretty much me and thank you so much. So this is my happy dance. Thank you, dance. So thank you so much everyone for this wonderful opportunity. And uh, I'm sure that you might have lots of questions which I think we'll have time later on to discuss upon. So thank you so much everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Engineer uh, Darpan Purasaini for your wonderful and exciting presentation that uh, we have been seeing that you people are working in this field using such kind of new technologies because we have been always watching movies uh, about this augmented reality, virtual reality and others and combination of that. And so the examples that you have shown today uh, is how can we use this kind of uh, latest technologies for our uh, disaster risk reduction or disaster risk management, which is very, very new uh, field in in case of Nepal. Uh, but uh, we can use this one and uh, for this uh, better visualization and involve people to show the, uh, you know, the tends to the reality. And uh, as you have uh, rightly mentioned that we can work on this real time. That is very fantastic, uh, you know, opportunity uh, from these technologies. So uh, thank you very much once again. And uh, there must be lots of questions uh, uh, to you. Uh, please uh, go on and see the comments uh, in Zoom chat box and Facebook. I'll take uh, later on. Thank you once again. Now I would like to invite our uh, next speaker for today. He is uh, Nirmal Adhikari from Build Change Nepal. He's currently working as a new frontier technology coding hub manager at Build Change Nepal, a social enterprise that saves lives and economic losses in earthquake and other disasters by building safer houses and schools in emerging countries. As the NFT code hubbing manager, he's uh, responsible for developing and managing applications and coding solutions to save lives in disasters. This includes developing and managing mobile application, providing technical assistance and artificial intelligence solutions on reconstruction, Dominica, St. Martin, Colombia, Indonesia, Philippines, and Nepal. In addition to provide technical assistance, he has been Working in, he has been doing project management and the development of several mobile, web, and AI based applications with uh, terms of developers coming from Indonesia, Nepal, Philippines, and Colombia. This has led him to have a greater understanding of sub it is of developing web, mobile, and AI applications for communities and homeowners in the emerging world. And this is very, very important uh, uh, for us. And today is going to present artificial intelligence for decision making in retrofitting of earthquake damage building, which uh, Uttamji also mentioned a little bit, but uh, Nirmal Adhikari will uh, explain a little bit more. Uh, now I would like to invite again Nirmal Adhikari. The virtual floor is yours. Please proceed. Thank you, Vasantiji giving a good introduction of me <laughs> so yeah am i audible sorry yes okay. absolutely 
So let me start my slide. So. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see, but uh, okay, yeah, good. Can you just open your yeah, video yeah, as well? Fine. Yeah, of course. Mm. Yeah. Okay, hi everybody. Thank you for IHR to having this wonderful presentation. And I love to have this and I, I love to share my experience. So everybody know that the natural disaster kill on average of like more than 60,000 people per year. And as the world is moving very fast in terms of technology, we have to use those technology for pre-disaster awareness and post-disaster response to make an efficient workflow with very low cost. So I will start with a small introduction of my organization, which is Build Change. So if you don't familiarize with Build Change, then Build Change is non-profit social and enterprise organization whose mission is to save life. So we do this by working with government, civil society, homeowners, and technical persons such as engineers and builders to build a sustainable solution that they both culturally appropriate and structurally safe. So build chains work mostly on the disaster vulnerable country. So even in sometimes in pre-disaster, we provide awareness and sometimes in post-disaster, we also provide the technical assistance and help them to retrofit the houses. So in Nepal, we are working with Nepal government, ARC, UNFs, and Indian embassy to do the retrofit more than 3000 houses and provide the free technical assistance to the homeowner. So we have a small STFC technical support center in all of the earthquake affected area in Nuakot, in Sindhupalchuk, everywhere where there's the earthquake affected. And we are currently working in eight countries like Colombia, Guatemala, Haiti, Indonesia, Nepal, Philippines, Dominica, and San Martin. Currently we have the project over this country and in past we were like we had worked with Bhutan, China, Ecuador, India, Iran, and Peru as well. So yeah, this is just the introduction of what is Build Change and what Build Change is doing, but in terms of because we're talking about new frontier technology, how technology helps society in natural disaster everywhere. So how Build Change promotes NFT, so frontier technology. So because Build Change is always positive about promoting the frontier technology, that's why we have a separate department of, of this NFT. So we say that NFT department, we have a separate department where we do the research and development of latest and advanced tools such as the AI, computer vision, AR, VR tools, and implement those tools to provide end-to-end -end solution across all the work that I mentioned. And we are also trying to have a different workflow in other, other worlds such as we are also having some of those tools implementing and nearly implementing in Pakistan and Bhutan. So, Currently, we have a lot of solutions. Actually, some of the examples are we have a automated Rabbit and Dynamo tools, and we have the AI tools to have an inspection, to have a quality control. We have like AR, VR tool. You even see the Utamji has a demo that we did together. Yeah, and VR tools we have to educate the people, to have, give the awareness. And Autodex beam integration project planning and management tool to make a workflow pre better. So when you upload a beam, like you upload a, a rabbit script, it will automatically divide it into the project management and you can plan like to whom you want to give uh, the task and when you want to finish the task, it will be automated. So, and other, other automated tools for all the stakeholders. So you have a tools like the form builder because you have to collect the data from the field so still you need a form builder we have that our our tools that is integrated with mis integrated with ai different tools you have we have the ai assistant 
to to help engineers and and to help the homeowners to do some kind of survey if we need to so these are the tools that we are developing and we are also planning to extend it in future like not in future we are researching in very latest technology like the mixed reality as as darpanji also mentioned and on other vr tools and we are also using that on real engines that will help i'll explain this in later while while it comes so let's talk about the problem so when we hit by a disaster and what are the problems that we get so whenever the disaster happen so there is like uh whenever the disaster happen most of the infrastructure will not be destroyed completely so but partially damaged which we can repair either the retrofit depending on the damage level so if you have a lot of damage you cannot retrofit then you have to demolish but if you have a certain level of damage then you can retrofit by adding extra element structural element so these are the thing we can do and the first step is you have to go to the field and do the reconstruct at least you have to take a survey go to the field take a survey and because uh you have like depending upon how much you have engineer how much you have a capacity you cannot go and like survey each and every houses at the same time so it takes times and it's a very time consuming and sending the engineers every home and you need to spend a lot and a lot of more money even in in in, in disaster like nepal in 2015 when all the villages are damaged across the country and then you see that how slow and how expensive the process was even the retro the retrofit the reconstruction and the retrofit process is not completed so this means we are very slow in terms of rapid response we say the rapid response but it's actually not rapid it 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 it, it take a lot of time so these are these kind of things that we are addressing via like latest technologies like new frontier technology this is the things that we we are researching so what are the possible solution that you could do to to save a time and to save a lot of money so there are a lot of solutions you see that we have we can build a structural damage detection like the wall damage detection you see that the crack detection if you have a lot of crack you say okay you your house cannot be retrofit you have to demolish your house because uh, this are uh, if you if we develop this kind of solution it doesn't need like engineer have to go and survey the house even the homeowner can use that tools and survey that so that you 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 save your money you save your time you save your resources so that you can use that resources to do the same other extra things so another like you can give a ai assistance for survey so some kind of like okay so hey cd some for example or hey google or her has something i have my house is damaged and some sort of like it will say that okay uh how much damage is is your house or like how much story you have your house okay i have like two and half story and say that okay it is completely damaged this kind of like ai assistance you provide and based on that ai assistance you can have uh a decision making process that say okay now okay your house seems like good based on what you answer but if you want to more knowledge you can contact or your house is totally damaged based on your answer so you have to contact so this kind of decision making we can we can provide that there is another like using automated measurement using ar like the darpan g also uh explain that how we can use the ar in different different projects and like in post disaster in like pre disaster so we can use so you, you okay you have to measure a wall uh, and then you you send that and based on like the wall length the wall area you have like wall area percentage calculation i'm not like a structural engineer but while working i do this kind of term but yeah you can check all those measurement and based on those measurement and based on those crack like based on those you can say that okay your house can be retrofitted okay this is the decision that ai can like this new tools can make you can even like 3d mode so like you can do the 3d modeling and point cloud system with lidar like by flying a drone by you can use like satellite imagery by see that how many houses you, the the damage level of house so that so if you use the satellite imagery from the pre disaster and post disaster you see okay so in 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 this village or in the sindhu pajok there is like 200 house damage are not like uh, a must 
damage and in other area if there is a less damage you can prioritize those things so this kind of decision making and even you can use like ar vr tool and the mixed reality and extended reality as Darpanji said to say okay uh if you put your glass or like if, if you saw your mobile phone you can say okay this is my damaged houses and you can pull up the structural element and see that and so also so the homeowner to make a decision okay this is how your house looks like when you do the the retrofit thing or like if you do the retrofit by putting this element you can have this kind of things so this kind of thing we can make them like give a very good confidence to the homeowner to to have a decision making process to to put in a loop of the decision making process and make a uh, a uh sorry uh, to make very efficient pr progress of that so these are the possible solution i want to take you through the case study that what we did what Biltons did in nepal and the colombia and other what we are doing in other part of country so let's talk about the case study like how we use the ai or like this uh, technology to make work efficient and and save a lot of money of government or even the donors <laughs> So the case study, this is from the built in Nepal. So you know that uh, disaster struck in Nepal on 25 April. So in 2015, 11.56 AM, it's like whole story. I was there and I, uh, you see that 7.8 rectory scale is stuck in the mid region of Nepal and more than 30,000 people either killed or injured. And 800,000 damage like building damages you have the infrastructure damage and billions of dollar economic damage and you can even see that if it will be failed for generation and generation to come we even hadn't complete our a lot of like old heritage by making retrofit so these are the effect we can see that so what built sense did is we realized that sending the engineers in every house to, to measure the house, like it is very cost, like even sometimes you have to go through work three or four days, like one or two days to put on, like to, to reach an actual site. So that we thought we need to develop some like very amazing, not amazing also like the magical tools you say, uh, to help that engineers like not to go directly, they can have like free survey with uh, AI. And to do that, what we do did is we first uh, like see that what are the houses like, because most of the houses is not like damaged and destroyed. You see that partially destroyed first. What we did is we categorize that house in, we say in engineering terms, I think it's a, we say it like type design. So based on type design, we focus on like how many homes, let's suppose you have the RCC type design or like SMM type design, stone mud motor and, and, and uh, I don't know like other stumps, but there are like RCC and, and SMM and other, other type design. So what we did is we categorize those houses and see that which houses is most effective. So we found that SMM like stone and mud motor houses are uh, dam is like, and we see that there are a lot of similar kind of houses in village areas such as Nuakot and, and in Sidupalchuk, a lot of more than like SMM house type design. And what we did is we create a base design uh, of that particular house design. And what we did is we make a rabbit model, a base model of that design. So this is like for you can see a two and a half and it's like two story and one and a half story because in village you see that either two story or two and a half story like with attic and we post this kind of thing we see and we make a base design of that houses and we started to think of the solution and what we did is uh first categorizing the houses and then we study the behavior of the damage so what are the structure that is mostly damaged either the wall either the roof either the windows the door this kind of so we categorize and we make this model in in beam and then we in it model even you see this kind of video in in education in what utamzi uh, saw in vr so this is how we make a structure and what we did is we adjust that a type design and we replica based on the houses so we replica based on the windows door position like all of the windows door position you see this kind of and we make a 3d 
model of all those simulator houses and then we train that particular houses to the machine learning model to see like to make a decision whether that is a go or no go for, not for the detail a measurement but initially so that if we say that initial measurement will say go you can do the retrofit then in second step you can call the engineer this is how you can filter a lot of people if there is a really bad destroy then you say okay you cannot retrofit you have to do demolish so we don't have to send the engineer to go and measure all the houses to the to do the retrofit sorry so we we make all of these images and we train the machine learning to make a decision like either this house is go or no go and you can see a video so okay this kind of question we ask the preliminary question because based on this also this questions we filter to whom we are uh, are providing go and no go you see that we ask some of the questions because we based on that type design you we ask that whether your house is two and a half story because we are uh, specifically focused on that particular type design so they will type their address they will type their name and when they upload the picture it will directly go to the government and then our our, our back end staffs where they can see okay this house needs to be retrofit now the government can send the engineers or buildings can send the engineers to have more detail uh measurements to do the retrofit or if not the the we cannot do the retrofit so so yeah so you can see the video that video uh, like and this can be done by homeowner so when we upload this and we uh, in, in in play stores and you can even you don't need the internet because we know that in far region area you still don't have the internet so we deploy that model offline so you can directly see that whether your house is go or no go and, and even in like offline you don't have to worry about the internet at, at that time as well so you see that based on these houses this house is no go so we cannot do the retrofit of these houses so yeah, here is a short video. I want to show that uh, all what I explain in, in one video. The 2015 earthquake in Nepal left many rural communities devastated. In the weeks and months following the disaster, access was very prohibited for engineers to go out and perform assessments on damage to buildings. In many cases, what we find is that the house is still standing, but the temperature is too high to be considered safe for occupancy. One innovative approach that we're currently using is to save the house and help the homeowner return to their normal lives by strengthening the home with a structural retrofit. Through scaling retrofitting, we can save millions of lives by preventing building collapse and future earthquakes. One major challenge with this, however, is the time and resources to send engineers to the field to perform structural assessments. Structurally retrofitting a building typically involves strengthening it from within by connecting a series of reinforced concrete columns and beams to the existing walls and structure. Prior to this, however, we typically have to do an analysis of the existing home to ensure that it is actually a candidate for retrofitting and will be compatible with our design. This involves looking at the proximity of openings to the corner of the buildings, the amount of solid wall between the openings, and the size of the openings themselves. Our solution is to train artificial intelligence to do this analysis for us. We've programmed our 3D modeling software to run through hundreds of thousands of potential configurations of opening the facade of the building. This allows us to pre-train the AI to determine which houses are a go or a no-go for retrofitting without using real photos of buildings. The next step is to invert those images and detect their edges, along with photos of real houses to blur the lines between what has been generated and what are actual photos. For collection of data, we've produced a mobile app that asks a few simple questions, then allows a homeowner to take a photo of their house and submit it to our cloud, where the AI will determine if the house can be retrofit or if it cannot. The power of this solution lies in the ability to crowdsource data once a disaster has struck. By having a pre-trained AI, we have a system that's rapidly deployable in any country or context immediately after the event. This approach will allow us to universalize access to safe housing for the remaining hundreds of thousands of houses yet to be retrofitted in Nepal, as well as millions worldwide in countries prone to natural disasters. 
This permits reconstruction to commence much more quickly and helps get homeowners back on track for their normal lives. This is how we did our retrofit, uh, the first step of retrofit without sending an engineer or like using a local communities, using a local like even the homeowners sometimes they upload their photo and based on that we say go and no go. And after Nepal, we visited and had the same problem in, in Colombia. So I'll, I'll have a second case study that how we implement this retrofit supply decision making process in Colombia. The thing is Colombia has a different type design. Even we have like with the RCC, what we did was with SMM, stone marmotra in Nepal because a lot of houses we have to retrofit was a cement. And but in Colombia we have you see the brick walls and then for that we took an approach of same but slightly different. Now we even these tools in Colombia is using by government of Colombia to even check the houses, inspect during their, their, their retrofit tools. First what they did is like they check with this uh, mobile app whether they have to be retrofit because this is not like after pro, uh, post disaster, this is like prevention from the disaster. If disaster happens, a lot of houses will will collapse. So the government say that, okay, we have to strengthen house before the disaster happens. So we don't lose our, a lot of money and economics on that. So what we did is like, they take our applications and they scan the houses and then they say, okay, whether that house is go, good or no, no go for to do the retrofit or whether they have to demolish, whether they don't have to do anything. So in this approach, like we tested each and every element, not, not just from the wall, like if the house is damaged, like first we detect the wall and if the, they have to retrofit and we check inspect all these. So you see that there are a lot of checks that we do on the houses. So this wall check is before uh, the demolition before retrofit and then what we, what, did is like they took a picture of wall they see that and process the images and say okay this is go for a retrofit or no go for a retrofit and same these things will be loop after they create a wall and when they develop like let's suppose they demolish a wall or they retrofit a wall and they will take a picture again and at this time this will be kind of inspection by the government authority from the Colombia and they see the picture and this picture okay they say okay this, if this is a fine and they say okay this inspection is good they did a good retrofit and while during inspection they also check the rebar and like the rebar case and we have like other a lot of tools that I don't want to mention, but all the structure element, but uh, we do by like one by one by inspector by government before they, they make a houses or like they demolish the houses before they retrofit the houses and after they retrofit the houses, they use the same tool as inspection as well. So this is how we are implementing in Colombia also. And we're also planning to implement the same thing in, in Philippines very soon. You see that uh, uh, portability in a short future of these tools is like there is still many thousands of homeowners in Nepal that could be benefited by this platform. They can see their tools. Even you see in, in, in even the Tamil, even in New Road, the houses are not retrofitted. They, they, they are just using uh, this kind of support to prevent, but they are not uh, retrofitting the houses. Yet. So th these kind of things, we have like a lot of people in Nepal, homeowner in Nepal that can benefit by this certain application and even the government to see it. And in the future, long run, what we are planning now is what we did is now we are mixing the, uh, the 3D images and the live images to train the machine learning. But in future, what we, we are planning to do is we skip all the photos of real images. And what we want to do is we want to train the AI with only the, the 
whenever a uh, disaster happen in some country we can deploy the tool directly without uh, having the the machine learning training with having the real images we can train all those with the virtual images and this system will be ready in one day after disaster happen or maybe like in in half day disaster happens so this kind of things okay thank you that's it from my side if you have any questions you can provide the, the questions in chat or, or i'll reply after in the session if uh, you are thank you me, there is the email okay thank you uh, okay thank you nirmal Ladikari, for your uh, wonderful presentation of this artificial intelligence how can we use uh, this in case of disaster risk management or disaster risk reduction uh, can you please close uh, your screen sharing Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah, I mean, this is real you know, examples. How can we use this uh, frontier technologies for uh, post-disaster uh, reconstruction uh, after the major disasters, not only in uh, earthquake, but also in other uh, disasters like landslide, flood, or tsunami, or whatever and the, that we face. Thank you once again, Nirmal Adhikari. Please go through the chat box. You might have some questions or later on, uh, participant will ask. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, now, I would like to uh, invite another presenter for today, uh, who is uh, engineer uh, Pukar Prazuli. Uh, he is a UAP and GNSS enthusiast from Dhulikhal, Nepal. He graduated from the Kathmandu University in 2019 with a bachelor degree in geomatics engineering. He has been involving in various trainings related to UAB and GNN, GNSS as a trainer. In the presentation, uh, engineer Puda Parazuli will be discussing about the cost time effective method for monitoring estimation and mapping spatial temporal variability of soil deposition erosion within the time frame at a local level using the low altitude remote sensing. And it the end one can know the volume of soil deposited and also witness the change in the course of river within uh, the time frame and this is very very important for this understanding of you know the uh, complex interaction or cascading effect of landslide earthquake generated landslide and then the flooding to the downstream and this is very very important uh, for the, in the context of mountain co communities and other part of the growth, globe. So uh, now I would like to invite uh, engineer Pukar Parazuli. Uh, the virtual room is yours, please proceed. Thank you, sir. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody want, everyone is uh, uh, fine, safe and doing well in this pandemic. So this is me Pukar Parazuli and today I will be uh, talking about the our project, the estimation of soil, uh, estimation of soil deposition in the section of Punyamata River. Uh, so using uh, UAV, uh, uh, as uh, as we all know that Nepal is one of the most uh, uh, disaster prone country in the world because of its uh, rocked topography and uh, according to the governmental report as uh, published in uh, Kathmandu Post in uh, 2019 September, uh, more than 80% of total population of Nepal is under uh, some risk of uh, some kind of uh, disasters and among uh, those disasters, flood and the landslide is uh, most common yet they are highly uh, devastating disaster in Nepal. So now Excuse me. Uh, we know that uh, erosion and uh, deposition are the main uh, responsible for uh, the transformation of the landforms. Uh, landforms that are uh, erosion and deposition that are caused uh, due to the flood. And uh, though there are many cases of floods and landslide in Nepal, uh, not enough assessments had been done to ensure its. Uh, effect uh, and uh, to reduce the, the uh, effect. Uh, so uh, to study those effects and uh, the causes, uh, we can uh, apply various uh, modern techniques. 
such as a ground based surveying aerial survey uh, satellite uh, imagery uh, for knowing the deposition of the uh, deposition from the flood and uh, today we will be talking about the uav that allows us uh, rapid low cost and accurate estimation of a uh, estimation of deposition in the low scale so aim and the objective of our uh, study will be and the aim will be to demonstrate the use of uav uh, that could be used for the mapping and estimation of soil deposition similarly objective uh, as a objective uh, the main uh, primary objective will be to estimate the volume of soil deposition in the certain section of punemata river whereas as the secondary objective we will be also uh, assessing the accuracy of the digital terrain model that has been acquired from the uav photogram photogrammetry so the what methodology we have followed is shown in this uh, diagram the first um, planning and site selection in site site selection we had uh, selected the small and most and most and highly affected uh, area due to the flood and after the site selection dgps survey is done using the stonex gnss receiver and we had established 10 uh, ground control points for georeferencing then uh, we had take down the uav survey and we had used uh, phantom 3 advanced and pixel capture uh, for the flight planning uh, drone was uh, flight drone we fought the drone in uh, 50 meter altitude from the ground uh, and uh, overlap was 80 60 front overlap was 80% and lateral was uh, 60% and uh, uh, 136 uh, to 140 in two different time frames images were uh, occurred and the one of the example of image uh, was sorry is shown above uh, raw image and uh, image process we had uh, later done the image processing in pix4 mapper and georeferencing was also done uh, in same app uh, and dtm and orthophoto high resolution dtm and orthophoto was gained from the same software and analysis was done the same workflow is uh, used for the both years images we had done this project in 2016 and 17 in the same place for the comparison so how the so volume was uh, calculated is shown in this uh, example uh, of dtm uh, this is these are the cell values of dtm 2017 and that was subtracted subtracted from the dtm of 2016 and uh, what we get is the deposition uh, for uh, the to check the accuracy of the dtm we had uh, to check the accuracy of the dtm uh, we had established uh, 20 checkpoints and uh, how the accuracy was computed was that uh, x uh, the same the z value from same x y and the from the uh, dtm from image and the ground were uh, computed and the rmsc was uh, gained so following the methodology and the data we had uh, we with the available data we were able to compute the volume of the soil that was deposited, deposited in the bank and it was found to be uh, 74161.42 meter cube uh, and the rmsc of the dtm of uh, 2016 and that of 2017 are uh, 0.072 meter and 0.078 meter uh, respectively and uh, what we can visualize from the map in the right hand side is uh, that generally the central part of the study area uh, has uh, the maximum deposition um, as it is the flattest part of the region and uh, in compared to the outer region so uh, the we had uh, there was also the waste uh, treatment plant uh, so we had neglected the waste treatment treatment plant during the volume comparison uh, sorry volume estimation uh, uh, what we similarly what we also witnessed was that at the end of the project was that uh, the course of the river was uh, changing uh, from 2016 to 2017 uh, so we 
plotted the graph uh, at the three different places of the uh, river to study the change. And what we uh, saw was the um, different change and uh, the river course was changing significantly. So we were now curious how long is this process going on. So we we didn't add the previous year's uh, images. So we go, uh, we uh, we watched it in uh, Google Earth, and what we found was uh, amazing, or let's say exciting. So in 2001, the river was like in the left hand side. Then in 2010 and in 2017. From 2010 to 2017, in the gap of seven years, the change was significant. So now, uh, with all these outputs, the uh, orthophotos and uh, DTMs, what we can do is, uh, what we can further study is, we can also uh, uh, assess the physical infrastructure damage from the high resolution orthophoto and DTMs. Similarly, uh, the cadastral parcels that have been uh, dismissed by the flood or those uh, uh, soil depositions can be relocated. Similarly, river uh, coastal erosion study can be done and uh, those agricultural products that has been uh, lost due to the flood can be estimated and uh, flooding inundation mapping can be done. Similarly, morphological change due to the change in course of a river can also be studied. So as a conclusion of this project, uh, what we can know is that uh, UAV can be used as a, for the cost time effective method for monitoring, estimating, and mapping the spatial and temporal reliability of soil uh, deposition, and uh, many other further uh, applications can also, uh, for further applications, these high resolution orthophotos and uh, DTMs can be used so finally, these are some images of the area during the floods. Uh, though the river seems to be small, it uh, causes the use uh, devast uh, devastation. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pukar Parajuli, for your uh, very informative presentation. I'm pretty much impressed because you know I'm also working uh, in similar areas. Um, so can you just close your uh, screen sharing? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah because you know, this is study, uh, I have been using uh, UAB uh, technologies uh, for uh, a river, uh, fluvial hydrology and other, for uh, understanding the long-term changes in the Himalayas. So interaction between sediments and then the uh, uh, sedimentation to the uh, downstream uh, ultimate to the foothill of Himalaya. And uh, your study, what you have rightly presented, the case study where uh, we can use such kind of technologies for uh, you know this construction material survey that every uh, local authorities in Nepal and around other part of the world also they are using this uh, construction material survey and sell for the economic benefit and to understand and to calculate and accurately how much construction materials do we have in the riverbed or in other uh, sand or the clay or other dominant regions that is really, really important. And we are, we, till now we are using very, you know, classical way of uh, calculating these things, but the, the technology what you have presented is uh, quite interesting. And I congratulate for your wonderful work and uh, presentation. And I hope there will be lots of questions the, uh, there in Zoom chat box and from Facebook, I will uh, see some of the questions if you have all. Uh, thank you once again. You, so now I would like to request uh, uh, our participant to post the questions if you have in the time being. Uh, uh, I think uh, most of the questions uh, have been already answered by our uh, presenters. Um, and I don't see any other questions uh, unanswered in Facebook. Uh, most of these things have been already answered. Uh, here in Zoom chat box, um, 
Okay, I'll uh, start from uh, Narottam Sreshta, direct question to Pukar Parazuli. Can we apply this UAB technology to find debris volume in Landsat or similar images? Do you have any observation on it, Pukarji? Uh, yeah, we can use uh, Landsat images, but uh, the resolution of Landsat images can be low compared to the UAV, so it may be difficult in a low scale, but in large scale, um, it can be possible. Okay, yeah, that, that's a uh, wonderful uh, uh, answer. So one question from uh, Upendra Baral, uh, he is asking in Facebook, all these uh, you know, artificial intelligence that are in use in post disaster can give an enormous data, but his question is to all presenter, maybe somehow anyone can answer is that how efficiently the affected people get post disaster information and how do you share your findings? So it's more about, uh, you know, checking data information and more on disaster information uh, management system. So uh, I don't know who will give the answer. Maybe uh, Nirmal, uh, can you just uh, highlight this thing a little bit? Yeah, actually, uh, the thing is there are a lot of methods that you can provide the information to the homeowner. One thing is like the mobile, the app. So you have the app that you can see the progress and you can also see the information where you are in terms of when post disaster happen. You see that Facebook also give the initiative that uh, like whether you are safe or not. That information can be directly go to the government so that you can share information. And based on that information, the government can analyze or uh, sometimes what happens is there is no access of internet and what we do with the app and at those time you can use the sms method with app if there is no internet uh, the your uh, information where you are and whether you need a help or not this, this information can be provided through the sms so this kind of like platform even like if the the homeowners are a bit smart they can have so they can access the web portal, they can have the email address, but basically, main, I, I have seen a lot of homeowners, but basically the homeowners were in a remote area, they just have a cell phones, and at the, that time, all the information that you can provide it via SMS in their mobile phone. Yes, uh, thank you. It's a really informative answer. And that, yes, we can do that uh, DIM is uh, efficiently, if we have a better, you know, uh, internet connection and other thing. Uh, so another question from Milena Vara Ruiz. Uh, maybe it's an open question, but uh, I'll ask the question and maybe uh, Uttam can address this uh, uh, question. Do you have examples of the use of EAV technology in the assessment of the impact of war, bombing, mine, IEDs, lying, or in order to better plan and prioritize the humanitarian mine action and clearance operations? Uttamji, can you address this question a little bit? Uh, the sir, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Okay, so that's an interesting question. Actually, we had, a, so um, I didn't mention the details before, but um, the Flying Lab Network, it works, it, it currently exists in uh, around 30 countries. And if you want to look at use cases of how uh, drones have been used in war situation, then there are some blog posts that I could forward uh, to you, some of the works done by our colleagues in other countries. But for a specific example, you can look at India. Uh, they used uh, drones to identify where the mines have been placed at war affected areas. Okay, thank you, Tamji. And uh, Rajan Gurung is asking uh, in Facebook, so it's, uh, I think it's directly related to Pukar again, because the soil deposition, okay, the depth of soil or the volume of soil deposition, can, can it be calculated in the flood situation? Is it totally raster calculation or vector or what kind of methods do you use? Uh, it is the raster calculation and uh, exactly during the flood, it could be difficult, but uh, after the flood and after and the remnant, what is remain after the flood, it can be calculated. But during the flood, it uh, could be difficult for the calculation. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, 
Yes, uh, I have some uh, observation on this also because, you know, most of the participants uh, are asking that uh, do we need the permission to fly drone or not? And uh, I think it's already answered somehow. Uh, 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 what I see over there. And, uh, you know, uh, but, you know, there are other kind of technologies that you can use. For example, uh, terrestrial lighter scanner. Uh, you can use and you can go to the field take and you know you can do the survey so yeah i mean there are lots of technologies and in terms of the retrofitting what uh, we can do to identify the inside structures uh, you know in on damaged building condition maybe we can use uh, you know ground penetrating radar to see what actually the beam and the condition of the pillars and what's the bonding and you know so, so many things you, you can use uh, using this uh, new uh, technologies so i think i will stop here taking question but i would like to uh, request our presenter uh, uh, one or two minutes to keep or explain a little bit uh, if uh, you couldn't answer uh, in the Zoom chat box. In that way, I would like to uh, uh, invite, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, Basanta sir, Professor Maske has raised his hand, so maybe. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Suraj, can you just unmute him? Uh, He's our, we are very pleased to have uh, him in our, this webinar. Uh, so Maske sir, please go ahead. Suresh, can you just unmute him? Yes, he's already unmuted. Maske sir, please go ahead. I don't see here. We cannot hear you, Master Shah. I think you you have a problem with the microphone. Yeah. We didn't hear you. Okay. So uh, maybe he uh, will invite him again. So uh, Tom G, do you want to say something at the end, very brief? I think I can I can see him being the co-host. Maske sir, can you speak, please? Otherwise, I will. Uh, Maske okay. sir, uh, uh, I think he uh, has some problem with his microphone. Yeah, Utamji, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, Basanta sir. So, just as a concluding remarks, I just want to highlight a few things. So, as I am also a part of uh, IHRR, part of the co-founding team. And as Basant Dasar mentioned in the very beginning that uh, Nepal needs to focus on and the uh, Nepal needs to focus on the introduction of science and technology. Otherwise, if we just continue like doing things the traditional way, then the path to resilience, disaster resilience will be very long. And I can see a lot of present uh, participants here in the audience uh, comes from a DRR background and also from other background. So please uh, reach out to us if you have any interesting story of using science technology and DRRM in, in disaster redu risk reduction. Please let us know because ISRR is always focused on bringing out such stories. So we had Pukar today in our presentation. And uh, if you don't know, Pukar is a recent graduate from Kathmandu University and he has done many amazing uh, projects with drones. So our focus is to bring uh, people like Pukar uh, in forum like this so, can, so that we can share their stories and please reach out to us if you have a DRR a technology interventions in DRR related project so that we will highlight it and together we will promote science and technology in DRR. Thank you, Basan sir. Thank you, uh, uh, Engineer Uttam Prasani. Now I would like to invite Professor Rijan Bhakta Kayasta to, uh, uh, to uh, say mm -hmm. some concluding remarks. Okay, thank you, Basanta sir. Uh, so I have seen the two questions in the chat box, which I have already replied. I think uh, those questions are also very uh, good and very interesting. And Narottam Sastra asked about uh, whether we can uh, see the three layers of debris, snow and ice, and the houses which were buried in the Langtang ice and uh, rock avalanche. I think from the UAB, we can't see those three layers, 
from the UAV, we can see just the surface one. For in order to see the down subsurface, we have to use the GPR. But uh, from the loading of the surface, we can see that on the surface we have debris and then snow and ice, and at the bottom we can find some houses, which is very obvious, I think. And the next question is whether we can use this uh, UAV uh, for the so, uh, fissure tracking in order to get the glacier velocity. Yes, we can use uh, fissure tracking uh, methods for determining the surface velocity. And so I think, uh, as I have said in, the, in my presentations, we have to use uh, the UAV surveys on the glacier studies so that we can have a very detailed glaciological data so that we can forecast or we can predict what will be the future water resources scenario as well as how the glacier will behave in future. So with that, I think uh, I want to conclude my remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kayasta. It's a wonderful remarks. Thank you once again. And now I'd like to invite uh, Engineer Darpan Purasaini to say a few words for the concluding remarks. And uh, if you have something to explain, if you have received any questions in Zoom chat box for you, directly towards you, please. Uh, thank you, sir. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for this wonderful opportunity. And you know, it was really engaging. And I got to learn lots of things from the presenters as well. Um, regarding questions, there were a few questions, but I believe uh, we had uh, some level of engagement through the chats as well. But definitely, you know, I think uh, the organizers would definitely share the email addresses with all participants so that we can carry forth the conversation. Um, if we have any queries and more than that, you know, if anyone is uh, trying to or looking to collaborate uh, in any kind of project that makes use of any kind of frontier technology, whether that's drones, AI, you know, we are all available here and we are trying to, uh, you know, make proof of concept technology in Nepal. So let's collaborate with each other. So I don't have a much regard, much concluding remarks because, you know, uh, all of our participants have already expressed uh, almost all the things. So there's this one final thing I would like to conclude with. Uh, any technology like, you know, uh, in a society like ours, what I have evidently found is whenever a new technology comes, people resist the change or people resist the technology uh, thinking that it will bring about lots of disruptions or, you know, huge changes uh, that are unforeseen. But what I, I would like to request to everyone is like, you know, let's not see technology as something that makes a huge change, but let's uh, use technology like uh, something or a tool that, you know, actually adds functionality to something that's already there. So for instance, uh, when drone was introduced in Nepal, so like back in 2015, we introduced uh, Drone Nepal as the first drone service company. But almost for two years, you know, we had to spend lots of time in educating people because everyone was thinking like drones are here to replace each and every technology. But the scenario is not like that. You know, there are some limitations and drone is here to augment the technology. So the case with all the frontier technology is the same. Uh, let's try to think of new ways. Let's think out of the box how we can make use of the technology in already existing problems and processes you know, so that we can actually create impact. So the main goal of using technology is not to, not just to, you know, uh, have a product uh, that you can show to the world, but actually have something that can be used in the field and that people can make use of ultimately, right? So let's uh, collaborate on these regards and, you know, we are all open to uh, open collaborations. So thank you so much, everyone, once again. Thank you, Engineer Purasani, for your wonderful uh, concluding remarks. Yes, we have to work together for sustainable uh, risk reduction uh, in the mountainous areas and other part of the globe. Now I would like to invite uh, Nirmal Adhikari. Do you have uh, something to say as a concluding remarks? Nirmal? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so thank you everybody. It's a very wonderful webinar. And then it's a very good that everybody is sharing their knowledge and, and it's in, in, in new frontier technology because there are a lot of development, development happening all around the world. And it is a very good opportunity to share like this so that we know what is currently going on and where and how people are implementing these things. And I think there is one question remaining by Varad Pradhan. He's asking about how we are input, input how are the input parameter for the damage is structure determined for the case for each house is service. So actually when you train the deep learning, Varadji, or, or machine learning, 
there are certain rule checks. You don't have to worry about each house. You just have to provide, uh, you have a, like similar as a MRT or non-MRT, you have that guideline so that you can provide a guideline, you can pass the instruction and train via that instruction so that you don't need for each houses. So it will be kind of make for a, a, a mass of houses. So it's not important for that in the machine learning, but it's also depend upon how you are training the machine learning model. And thank you uh, everybody. And the thing is, I'm always open to have this latest technology to help the mankind because we are doing the same things from like past um, uh, more than five years that we are doing the same thing. So if you have any idea or if you want to know that how we are implementing these things, this latest technology, I'm always open to share and to present and to implementing all those ideas. And if you have any ideas, if you want to know that, you, you can always reach throughout me. I'll be, I will be always available. Yeah, that's it for, for from my side. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Nirmal Adhikari. Yes, we are open to for any kind of uh, collaboration and we have to work together. Now I'd like to invite engineer Pukar Parazuli. Do you have any final words to uh, say uh, as a concluding remarks? Uh, I do I have nothing much, but uh, I would like to thank you all for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, I have learned, I too, I have also learned a lot from the other presentations. So I would like to say that uh, UAV is an amazing technology but in Nepal, it is not flourished uh, as much, um, and we have a lot to do with it. Uh, I hope all the answers to me, questions to me are answered. If not, and you have, if you have uh, more queries, uh, you can always uh, mail me. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Pukar Prajuli. Yes, uh, we have to work together, and I would like to invite all our participants and uh, presenter to work together. And, uh, you know, as uh, uh, we know that we are working in this field for a long time together, but sometimes we are, uh, you know, working silos. Now I'd like to invite uh, uh, Professor Ramesh Maske, sir, to say a few words. Uh, as soon as, can you just uh, unmute his microphone? Yeah, he's already unmuted. Uh, Professor Maske, uh, please go ahead. I don't know what's the problem. He's already unmuted. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Professor Maske? Still, he have a problem with his microphone, I think. Y yeah, <laughs> yeah. Looks so. I think. You hear me now? Yeah, yes, yeah, it's yes, yes, please yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay, there was a problem with the headphone and without help for headphone. So uh, thank you so much for this very interesting um, uh, talk today, webinar. Back in 2013, I, I still remember 2014 when Uttam and others were studying at Kathmandu University. We were... Uh, <clears throat> making the UAV and wanted to measure the thickness of ice and the glaciers. And now after seven years, uh, it has already, you know, taken a very great height of uh, utilization of UAV in Nepal for many di different things in civil engineering and geomatics, as well as disaster management. And um, um, I had that mind and also as uh, I heard that Dr. Basandra Zadikari is also doing hydrological survey and, and different rivers, we utilized UAV uh, for uh, you know, measurement of uh, the cross sections and profile of Kali Gandaki. It's back in 2017, 2018. Now still, this report has to come, uh, WWF and uh, Kathmandu University together. Dr. Reason was also in my team as a co-investigator. Uh, co we utilized uh, UAV, but there were uh, many different problems, even the UAV utilization in such a difficult areas was not uh, very much thought by everybody. It was a thought of using for filming or for, you know, for many different entertainment and other, but not for the actual engineering field. But what we faced problem is um, <clears throat> we used this uh, Phantom 3 also that time. And I myself was also flying the uh, UAV. Um, 
my aim was to uh, wherever not possible the the kaligandak is very big river and not possible we wanted to utilize uav but even the uav was also very difficult because of different um, different things like uh, permission and other things also you know the long range of flight was not possible but i'm still optimistic that it is very much um, a utilizable technology uh, wherever we don't have access to uh, to reach out and a very difficult terrain to take the uh, uav could be a good solution to take that but there is a solution uh, integration of you know the lidar technology in uav recently we did not lidar technology but very funny way of uh, taking rapid visual assessment of four glacial lakes it is still uh, not finished um, you know final stage of report we have submitted to undp to study uh, glacier lakes uh, <clears throat> um, in um, in western part and eastern part of nepal um, we did integrate uav inside the helicopter uav inside the helicopter it's a combination of helicopter and and uav because that was very innovative approach of uh, you know avoiding the disaster for from our side also not to have uh, you know difficulties in that uh, difficult terrain it's it's a fantastic uh, technology i think uh, more and more uh, researchers working on innovating or developing the uh, innovative uh, technologies uh, for the use of uav in such a terrain that's why i'm very happy that now Now, now the whole bunch of uh, you know community is working on UAV, and that is uh, uh, very good for us to see how we are utilizing. Recently, Kudasini um, um, uh, Drone Nepal also did um, you know UAV survey of the terrain in in um, Pachkal uh, within very short period of time. That was fantastic, and I. i saw the uh, the topography is uh, very professionally drawn and so uh, i think that that is good um, and the way of you know other technologies being developed like artificial intelligence integrating in by build um, <clears throat> was a very good uh, innovative approach i am myself a civil engineer and i like that idea very much a use of ai and nowadays it is uh, high talk in the city artificial intelligence and ministry of uh, of education science and technology is also very uh, open in uh, having the artificial intelligence in so as being a coordinator of science or national uh, committee for unesco myself um, i look forward to have uh, that type of things also in civil engineering and geomatics engineering uh, for management of disaster so i congratulate uh, you Uh, leading uh, led by dr basant adhikari who is um, <clears throat> organizing this um, very good seminar um, thank you so much for the presenter and also uh, the participants um, and i look forward to have more such uh, friend you know exchanging seminar in future thank you thank you professor maske for your encouraging words and i still remember that uh, your project in kaligandagi as i'm working in kaligandagi basin uh, i would say that since 2005 when i started my phd in that basin and in the downstream what you are working on these uh, you know water shed and others and i still remember and yeah uh, we have to work together and you know i'm working in east of engineering at one university where we can, we are using such kind of technologies and uh, you know research and development to train our graduates uh, not only graduates but also you know uh, for the policy makers and also at this institute for of himalayan risk reduction which is you know research organized and working in this field in drr and drm uh, you know focusing on different uh, dimension and multitude of the disaster risk management and of course we are very Uh, looking forward to working with uh, all and professor maske thank you for your wonderful final uh, concluding remarks and that's it from my side uh, and i hand over now uh, suraj gautam please uh, thank you so much dr basanta raj adhikari uh, for the as usual excellent moderation and making this webinar session very much lively 
It is indeed always a pleasure hearing from you. Uh, Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction advocates and prioritizes the science-based decision making on disaster risk reduction and management. And it was really interesting to see the brightest minds who have been piloting the use of the latest frontier technologies for disaster risk reduction in action today. So yes, we'd like to thank Engineer Uttam Prasaini for the wonderful review on the application of frontier technologies. Uh, it was also really interesting uh, to see, to hear from Associate Professor Dr. Rizan Kayasta regarding the UAB solving of the uh, glacier and he also highlighted the need of uh, need to expand the use of uav sorbing for uh, the glaciers and glacial lakes uh, in different uh, uh, river basins we'd also like to thank engineer dapan purasaini for providing his insights and significance on virtual reality augmented reality extended reality and the mixed reality definitely these frontier technologies can aid in uh, understanding the real field scenario as well as enhance the psychological capacity uh, and also contribute in the decision making the dynamic environment of the extended reality uh, can thus help in wider visualization and create rooms for the cross collaborations. It was also interesting to see uh, important insights from uh, Nirmal Adhikari uh, about the use of frontier technology on retrofitting works, especially the case studies from the Gorkha earthquake 2015 and uh, also the Columbia were really interesting. Uh, the use of machine learning and computer vision to check the uh, but, uh, building and different uh, sorts of bylaws was really interesting and was really impressive to see. Uh, similarly, we'd also like to thank Engineer Pukar Parazali for pro providing his insights on the estimation of soil deposition in the river uh, through the use of UAB. So last but not the least one, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Ramesh Maske for his wonderful remarks. Uh, I believe these presentations have uh, been really helpful to all of our participants. Uh, we'd be really happy to work and collaborate in the days to come uh, by, the, by making the use of such kind of frontier technologies. The Q&A session was also really informative with uh, a, lot, a lot of number of quality questions. Uh, we tried our best uh, to address all of these questions uh, from our Facebook uh, page live streaming and also from our Zoom chat box. And uh, even our presenters were also replying uh, through the text as well. So in case, in case you have any further queries, please feel free to mail us at info at inhrr.org. I'd also like to convey my big thanks to all of our organizing team speakers uh, session moderator and our distinguished guests and participants for participating in this session. The session was really informative and interactive and we'll be sharing the recorded session on our YouTube channel and the links will be forwarded to the registered email address. We also have a scheduled webinar series on Geoscience for Sustainable Development tomorrow, that is August 23rd at uh, 8 p.m. Nepal uh, GMT plus 545. The topic is related to uh, importance of geoscience for achieving the sustainable development goals key issues, challenges, and opportunities, which will be presented by Dr. Ganesh Raj Joshi, who is a researcher at United Nations Center for Regional Development, UNCRD, Japan. Uh, we'd also like to mention that Institute of Himalayan Risk Reduction will be more than happy to collaborate and organize this kind of relevant webinar in the days to come. And with this, I would like to uh, sign up from uh, our session for today. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. I uh, hope you had a great time. And I would li also like to wish you uh, to stay, I mean, stay safe and stay blessed. Thank you so much. Namaste. 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 Bye-bye.